thank you to Aviana for reading that passage, Ephesians 4, verses 1 to 6. And we'll be thinking about it this morning under three simple questions. First of all, we're going to be thinking about what. What is it that Paul tells the Ephesian Christians and therefore us to do? What? Secondly, how. How do we put this into practice? And finally, why? So we can do that. Three very, very simple parts. Three simple questions. First of all, what does Paul say? How do we put it into practice? Why? What? How? Why? And what I'm going to do, first of all, is just think about the what. What is it that Paul says? Well, verse 1, he puts it really clearly. He says to these Ephesian Christians, and through them to us, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Now, that's really important that we get that before we move on. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. In other words, Paul says to these Christians, be what you are. Doesn't tell them to become something. He says, be, act as you are. Got me thinking, when I was in primary school in South London, long, long time ago, there was a phrase that we used to use all the time that you don't hear very much, but children, you know, when you're about seven or eight, all the time we would say to one another, act your age and not your shoe size. Do any of you remember that? We used to, you don't hear much about it. It always used to be act your age, not your shoe size. Now, I've got quite big feet, as you can see from this enormous shoe that's, I think it's size 12. Um, so I was, you know, I quite like that. But even with that... Uh, I didn't want to act my shoe size, which was smaller. I wanted to act my age. But if you think about that saying, act your age and not your shoe size, it's the same thing. What it's saying is not, not become something, just simply act according to what you are. Don't do something to become that. Act what you are. Because we, we don't, as particularly as Christians and followers of Jesus, we don't tend to think of it like that. We tend to, if we're honest, we tend to think of it more like, um, like citizenship. I've got my passport here says that I'm a, a British citizen, and uh, I got that because I was born a British citizen. But of course, I'm sure you know that uh, now you can become a British citizen, and there's even a British citizen UK test. And we tend to think a bit like that. I, I did a practice one yesterday, by the way. Uh, you have to get 75% in order to pass. And okay, I did it quite quickly, but I got 75%, so it was, it was pretty close. And we tend to think of it a bit like that, being a Christian, that, that it's like you've got to pass a test to get in. Uh, and so I thought I'd put that to a test today. So this is an example question from the UK citizenship test. Let's see how many of you get it right and whether how many of you have got to be UK, allowed to be UK citizens or not. So the question is, uh, and I got this wrong, by the way, who developed radar? Who developed radar? And you're given four options. A, B, C, D. A was John Logie Baird. B was Sir Frank Whittle. C was Sir Christopher Cockerell. And D was Sir Robert Watson Watt. So I'll do, say those four again, and then you're going to vote. A, John Logie Baird. B, Sir Frank Whittle. C, Sir Christopher Cockerell or D, Sir Robert Watson Watt. And those watching online at home, you can do this as well. We'll just do a show of hands. I'll, I'll just trust you at home. So first of all, hands up. Who thinks it was A, John Logie Baird? Uh, we've, got, we've got a few. We've got a few down here. Okay, hands down. Uh, B, who thinks it was Sir Frank Whittle? Uh, we've got s some more over here. Okay, so there's, there's about uh, a quarter. C, Sir Christopher Cockerell. Anybody vote for Sir Christopher Cockerell? And then finally, D, Sir Robert Watson Watt. So there's about, so those last five were correct. So you can be UK citizens. Everybody else is going to have to leave the country, I'm afraid. So that's, that's interesting, isn't it? That these are questions that people who are born and grown up here can't answer. But my point this morning, when we think about what Paul is saying, is that it's the kingdom of heaven belonging to God's family is not like that. It's not, the whole point he's making, it's not about passing a test. It's not about passing a test. No, what Paul is saying to the... Remember, we've had three chapters of Ephesians. Paul has been explaining all that is true about these people who've believed in Jesus. He has told them that already, this is in the past, already they are seated in the heavenly realms with Christ if they have believed in Jesus. 
Now, this is really important that we get this straight at the start of the service, because in a moment, Karen's going to talk about the how. She's going to say some of the things that we need to do, how we live, if this is true. But I want to say that what she has to say next is irrelevant if this isn't already true about you. Do not think Karen is going to give us a list of things we can do that if we get 75% of them, then we're in. That's not what Paul is saying at all, and I really want to underline that. Paul is saying what Karen and uh, Peter and others are going to go on to talk about, that's how people live if they have already believed in Jesus, and in the words of Ephesians, they are already seated at the right hand of Christ. So there's a challenge to start with the beginning of the service. Have you been born above the way it says in John's Gospel. So the, well, I became a UK citizen because I was born into this country. And you can't be born into God's kingdom, but in John chapter 3, Jesus said to Nicodemus that the only way you can enter his kingdom is by being born from above. Is that true of you? I say that to those listening online as well. Because if it's not true, do not go on to anything else in the service. That is the thing you've got to get sorted right right now? It's a big question for all of us to think about. Have you been born from above? Have you believed in Jesus as your Saviour and Lord? Now, if you haven't done that yet, then myself and Karen and others here at church, we'd love to talk to you. Uh, if you're here in the church this morning, uh, please talk to me. I'll be, I'll be at the front. Please come up to me as you're leaving and say you'd like to talk to me and we'll find a, a safe, socially distanced way we can do that. Or if you're watching online, uh, all the contact details are on our website, email, ring in. Really like to talk to you because all that comes next is pointless unless we've got this straight. What is Paul saying this morning? He is saying to people who are followers of Jesus, be what you are. Be what you are. So if you're not a follower of Jesus yet, we need to get that sorted right. Okay, so that's the first thing. That's what Paul is saying. He is saying, in effect, to Christians, not act your age, uh, not your shoe size, but he's saying, act according to what you already are in Christ Jesus. Okay, what we're going to do, if you uh, stay seated here at home, you can stand and jump around or whatever. But we're now going to have another hymn, and then going to hand over to Karen first on the video, and then in person for the rest of the service. But Be Thou My Vision is a great hymn which focuses our unity in Christ Jesus. So we're going to have that now. Thank you. It's good to meet with our friends, wasn't it? Even via Zoom, it's really good. And we've heard so much about the importance over the ch of the church as, as we study Ephesians together. And home groups are just, as they said, a fantastic way of being church uh, together and helping us to put the teaching of Ephesians into practice. So I would really encourage you uh, to take that up. Uh, maybe start a new home group. We'd love to see that happening under COVID. Uh, so do ask us if we can help you. Because remember that John sort of told us a couple of weeks ago, the church is God's plan A, not plan B or C. Being church family is plan A. No one is too far away to be part of God's family. No one is too young. No one is too old. People from every nation and language are included. People of all abilities are included. Everyone is invited to be part of God's family. This was God's master plan before the world began. We are united by his power with people all over the world. He has chosen us and loved us. And as John has already explained, for those of us that are Christians, that are believers in Jesus, he now tells us to live a life worthy of what we are. If that's who we are, then we need to live a life that's worthy of that. So our second question today is how? How are we going to do that? How are we to live that life? Let's have a read again of verse 2. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Wow. Really practical directions, aren't they? Yet even reading them, I'm thinking, oh, those are really hard. How often do they reflect me? We know that actually they're hard to put into practice because of our sinful human nature. So living a life worthy of the calling we have received doesn't always come naturally to us. And yet, because we are believers in Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit to empower us 
and enable us to live like that. Let's have a think about each of those things. What do they mean? Completely humble. Thinking more of others than we do ourselves. Gentle. That doesn't mean that we have to be a pushover or just kind of ignored, but it does mean showing kindness, showing mercy consistently to those around us. Being patient. I mean, seriously, you only had to watch Boris's announcement last night to feel impatient. When is this going to end? Yeah, you're laughing. That's good. I'm not the only one that feels a little bit impatient. Being patient. Even without coronavirus, to be fair, our culture is an impatient one, isn't it? We want everything now. We want it delivered yesterday, in fact. Uh, we have, you know, Amazon Prime delivery. We expect to get an appointment now. We're very demanding. You know, you can have it all. You can have it now. And God calls us to be patient, not just with life out there, but with one another. Because that also leads on to the last thing, doesn't it? Bearing with one another in love. Now, again, that doesn't mean letting others treat us badly for the sake of it and saying, oh, well, you know, I'll bear with you in love. But it does mean loving people despite the fact that they might not always be perfect, as indeed we are also not perfect. It means bearing with one another. But yeah, that kind of living is hard. It's not natural to us. And that's why we've got the question, how? How on earth can we live this life worthy of the calling we've received when everything in us goes against it? As we've already said, as believers in Jesus, we have received the Holy Spirit who enables us to be united to one another. That's why it says in verse 3, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of the peace. It is that Holy Spirit that unites us. And yet even that verse helps us to know that it's not necessarily easy when it says, make every effort. You know, in my life, putting effort in involves a bit of work, doesn't it? We actually have to put it into practice ourselves. We need to put some work in. But the Holy Spirit helps us when we find it hard. So it's a conscious choice, isn't it, to live that life worthy of the calling we've received. Now, I'm going to ask Peter to come up. Peter, as you should know by now, is our LST student this year. It's a different life being a student and uh, helping us in church. But Peter's got his cunning rucksack with him. So do you want to just uh, show everyone your wonderful rucksack? It's good. He's a very good student. He's come with his rucksack, come well prepared. And I want you to imagine, you know, going out for a day's walk with a friend I imagine that's why Peter's even got a rucksack, so that he can take with him and fill it with the things that he needs. Maybe a picnic lunch, maybe a water bottle, maybe a mobile phone probably, an extra layer of clothes in case it gets cold. He has to carry them, they they need to be there, but they're not a burden because they're going to help him complete the walk that he's doing. You done any nice walks while you've been at LST, Peter? Yeah, a few. Good. I think after Thursday you might be doing quite a few more walks with just one person. Um, but yeah, it's all good. We have, the, we have possibilities in action. So we're going to use that rucksack image to think about what we need to be walking together with Jesus, to be living a life that calls us to walk worthy of the calling. You see, those things that we read about in verse 2 are like bricks. Maybe you could hold up the first brick there, Peter. They're like bricks that we build together as a foundation for our lives, that we build our lives upon. So Peter, first into that rucksack goes a brick containing humility. Thank you. First brick to take with us. What will humility look like for us? Well, there's a song we're going to sing a bit later that sort of says serving each other using the gifts that God has given us. Not thinking that we're more important than others, but being pleased actually when someone else succeeds. That's that first brick that we're going to carry with us on our walk. Secondly, A brick that's labelled gentleness. Thank you. You pop that in the rucksack, Peter. That's great. What will that look like? Or maybe it would be a kind word, an encouraging phone call, a letter in the post, a text message, taking time to speak to someone. I think that's how it will play out, particularly at the moment. Then our next brick that we're told to add in, patience. As we've already said, not getting frustrated when we have to wait for something. Coronavirus particularly is teaching us to wait, isn't it? And wait. 
but trusting God, not just in that, but for his timing in things. God has all these things under control. He has not been taken by surprise. And we have to trust him and be patient. And patient with one another too. But I think that comes into the last one. I've just put love on the brick because I couldn't fit bearing with one another in love in it. But that's where it's from. Bearing with one another in love. Recognizing that each of us are not perfect. And we should love one another in the same way that we know God has loved us. That unconditional love that God has shown us through Jesus. You rucks that feeling a bit heavier now? Good, good, excellent. Now we stay united with one another through taking those bricks along with us as we walk through life. Those bricks are not burdens. I don't want you to think, you know, if you really did fill your rucksack with bricks, it'd be like, oh, I can't cope with this. But they're not intended in that way, are they? Like the essential food and the items that we discussed earlier for a day out. Having those bricks with us, those items, will help us to walk worthy of the calling that we have received. Thank you, Peter. You can take the bricks on your little journey back to your seat. It's great. And we can only do that, can't we, through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit giving us unity amongst God's people. And as that is displayed, if we allow the Spirit to enable us to display those things, what a picture that will be to the world around us. If we can admit how countercultural some of those things are, humility, patience, bearing with one another in love, then if we are enabled to show that, if that's how we live, we will be shining God's light into the community. And actually, we'd need to say very little because we would be demonstrating uh, God's love to those around us. It's good for us to apply these things practically, isn't it? So in a minute, some questions are going to come up. And uh, we're going to vote. And uh, we're going to vote with thumbs up. Can you do that? Just practice your thumbs up. Or thumbs down. You can do it at home too. Uh, So I want everyone joining in. These are really practical things. Do these things, yes, fit into the category of walking worthy, or don't they? So thanks, Aaron. So the first one, just as we get the PowerPoint up, is does this fit in? Going to speak to someone who is sitting alone. Is that a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Yep, pretty much everyone here has got thumbs up. That's fantastic. It is indeed a thumbs up. Um, Second one, PowerPoint will catch up with that in a minute. It's fine. Listening carefully to someone who's maybe preaching for the first time and then encouraging them. Is that a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Oh, I hope you're doing as well at home. Everyone in the congregation here is getting the hang of this really well. They're doing well. How about getting annoyed when someone else is chosen for something instead of us? Absolutely. So we'll just catch up. That is a thumbs down moment. Fourthly, messaging, calling, writing, contacting someone that isn't in your usual group of friends. Yep. Oh, you're good, you guys are. Thumbs up. That's a good way to do it. Complaining if a song is played too fast at church. You all laugh, but it happens, and it's a thumbs down, okay? The band are laughing on my left, it's good. (laughs) Taking time to join the church prayer meeting. John's got his thumbs up, glad to see that, John. It is, it's a good thing to be doing, isn't it? Uh, Oh, being patient, oh, I've just told you the answer now. Being patient if something doesn't happen the way we think it should, but just assuming the best of a situation, we're saying, oh, it's probably, you know, probably a good reason for it. Yeah, that's definitely a thumbs up. And then lastly, expecting people to do things my way. Definitely a thumbs down moment. Well, everyone here got it right. I don't know how you did at home. But more importantly, um, yeah, that was just a bit of fun. What examples can you think of personally to apply those instructions? Where in your life do you need to be more humble? Where in your life do you need to be more gentle? Where do you need to be more patient? Where might you need to bear with others more in love? And be thankful that we have the Holy Spirit. And because of that, 
we are enabled to do those things. To help us get to grips a little bit more with that, we're going to sing a song now that really drums those truths into us, that teaches us that we are the church. And uh, for those in Sunday Club who are watching this, uh, this is one, the CD, uh, that you've received in the last couple of weeks, so you can definitely be learning it at home. But thanks, Aaron. Uh, We'll sing this, well, hum this song now, or clap along or whatever. Well, in fact, what a great song to sum up the letter of Ephesians. A big thank you to Karen and her glamorous assistant uh, for getting us through how. So remember, we started what? Uh, Paul in Ephesians 4 is telling Christians to be what you are, not to become something, but to act according to what you are. And then Karen has explained the how about being gentle and humble and patient, bearing one another in love. But now in the verses 4 to 6 in our passage, Paul gives us the why. Why do we do this? Why is it true? And there's seven ones, aren't there? If you notice, verses 4 to 6, uh, the rule of one, you could call it, the seven ones. Three, three, and then a final one. There's one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and all of that is summed up that there is one God and Father of all. Why are we united in Christ? Well, because of the rule of one. We're in one body, there's one spirit, we have one hope. Because we follow one Lord, we have one faith, which we declare, one baptism, and we trust in one God and Father of all. Now, if you think about it, that that rule of one, the fact that it's all one, that is both incredibly inclusive, as we've just sung in the song, that no one is too far away, anybody is welcome to join this family. It's both inclusive, but also exclusive. It's inclusive, you know, all those arguments about which is the right denomination and arguments about the mode of baptism, etc. Paul, in one sense, cuts through all that, doesn't he? He just says, there is one body, there's one church, there's one baptism. So in one sense, it's incredibly inclusive. But also, if you think about it, saying that there's one is also really exclusive because Paul is saying there is just one. You know, for example, if I said, well, you know, football's a great game and what's all this bickering between teams and let's all just be one, I'm sure lots of you would agree. But then if I said, and that one team is, and you can guess what's coming, Crystal Palace, that's the point. You go, oh, no, but we don't all want to follow. So do you see the the oneness that Paul is saying is both wonderfully inclusive, anybody's welcome to join, But it's also exclusive. He's saying there is one Lord. There's only one Jesus. There's only one way to know God through Jesus. And that's what we express in the creed. In fact, later on, we're going to sing and say, as it were, the creed together. We affirm these are things we believe because there is one faith, only one faith. Now, let's think through this as we, we draw this together and we begin to apply it. In one sense, we've come full circle Because in the why, we're right back where we started, in that Paul is not creating unity. He's not saying to these Christians, you need to do these things to create the church. You're all divided and you need to be one. He's not saying that at all, is he? He is saying there is already a spiritual unity that exists, that once you've believed in Jesus, automatically you're part of this one body. You don't have to do anything. It's happened already. This is not a, a bottom-up thing. Uh, sorry, it's not a, uh, yes, it's not a, a bottom-up thing where we somehow sort of create unity ourselves. It's a top-down thing. This is something that God has already done in Jesus that we have to live out. But human nature is such, and we can all relate to this, that we try to do it ourselves. Don't we? we try to sort of make it happen. So lots of well-meaning things like the World Council of Churches and flowing out of that churches together. There's also well-meaning things where it's organizations that are trying to to get together and sort of make us united. And the intention is good, but Paul says it's a relational thing. It's not an organizational thing. You know, Christians don't need to be made one. They are one already. What we need to do is just live it out. It's not about organizational things primarily. It's about personal, relational things. All the things that Karen was talking about, being humble and patient and kind and bearing with one another in love, that's not a structural thing. That's an organizational thing. That's a one-to-one relationship thing. It's something that we just do day by day, isn't it? Uh, But human nature is to want to go for the big 
organisational thing, isn't it? It's why, it's why gyms are, are really struggling at the moment because, you know, most gyms, they work on the basis that they want you to sign up and pay your monthly 15 quid. But whether you turn up or not, they don't really care, do they? And we, all, we, we do that because, you know, you feel better. You feel as if you're getting better as long as each month it goes out, regardless of whether you turn up to the gym or those petitions that we sign online or those charities that we give to because we say basically you're going to fix these problems. Now I'm not saying those things are bad at all, but can you see that Paul's expression of unity is a one-to-one -one relational thing. He's saying that if you believe in Jesus, if you call yourself a Christian, a follower of Jesus, you are already united spiritually with all those in Christ, wherever they are, around the globe, whatever church, that's already happened. But the way you act that out, the way you show that's true, is by those day-to-day -day relationships, the way you treat personally, one-to-one, -one, those people, when you are humble towards them, when you're kind and you're gentle and you're patient, you bear with them when they're frustrating. So that's the application of Ephesians 4 today. The, the what, be what you are. The how, uh, be patient, humble, and gentle. But it works out in the what. Why? Because we are one already in Christ Jesus. So let's live it out. Let's do all the things. The home group is a, uh, as a great advert as we go into lockdown. Practically, let's put this into to practice in everyday one-to-one -one relationships. In fact, that's a challenge as we finish, isn't it? As quite timely, because uh, our Prime Minister announced yesterday, as I said at the start of the service, that from next week, the next four Sundays, we won't be able to meet in church, we'll have to be online. And this passage, I think, is really timely, because there is both an encouragement and a challenge here, isn't there, in the passage. The encouragement is, Paul says, our unity is already there spiritually. So it's saying next Sunday, lockdown will not change that at all. Paul says, if you have believed in Jesus, you are already seated at the right hand of the Father and you're united with all your brothers and sisters in Christ. You're part of God's family. And that next week, that will not change at all. Whether you're in this building or whether we're all watching online, that unity won't be affected in the slightest. So isn't that really encouraging that we can face lockdown knowing that we are united in Christ and whatever happens externally, nothing will touch that. That's the encouragement. But there's a challenge here as well, isn't there? And that's the physical presence. What Paul is saying is, yes, that's true spiritually, but if that's true spiritually, it needs to be worked out and demonstrated physically. And the only way you can do that is by being patient, by being humble, by bearing with one another and being kind. And that needs physical presence, doesn't it? You cannot do that remotely. There has to be some kind of bodily reality in that. Now, because of the lockdown, that might, as uh, Karen has already said, it might just have to be a phone call. But we all know that it can't be a recorded phone call. Even if it's just a phone call, you need that to express kindness or be patient there has to be some kind of sort of physical reality to back that up. So we're going to have to be really practical, put our thinking caps on, and creative, as Karen said, over the next month to think, well, okay, we're not allowed to meet physically. We could maybe go for a walk in the park with one other person. But if this is true, Ephesians 4, we've got to think of ways of bodily being kind to one another, whether that's calling someone up, uh, being kind and patient with one another when things don't work out. And we're going to have to think that out and carry on because who knows how long the coronavirus will affect us. So can you see that Ephesians 4 is both encouraging, it's a spiritual reality that lockdown doesn't affect, doesn't matter where we are. We are one in Christ. We don't have to do anything. Isn't that great? But it's also challenging. Paul says, if this is true spiritually in Christ, if we really believe this, then we're going to act upon it and we're going to act as if we're united. So physically, we're going to do these things. We're going to be humble, we're going to be kind to one another, we're going to be patient and we're going to bear with one another. So I'm going to just pray and then uh, to finish up the service, that's going to lead into a time of prayer uh, with the American election coming up. Uh, Alcus, one of our deacons, who is American himself, 
and he's voted in advance. He's going to pray for the election. That's going to move on to the Apostles' Creed. Uh, If you're at home, uh, you might want to say that out loud when the Apostles' Creed comes on. And then Karen's going to lead us in a prayer time on the video. And then finally, after that, so this is a warning for the band, after the video things, the band is going to come up and lead us in our last song, which is a way of singing the Apostles' Creed too. So I'm just going to pray and then over to the video. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what we've learned from Ephesians 4. And I pray now that uh, spiritually we might receive and understand and live out the fact that we are united in Christ Jesus. Thank you for that great news. uh, That each one of us who have believed in Jesus are part of this global universal family. In fact, amazingly what Paul says, we're not just part of the family now at this moment, but we're also seated with saints from the past. Hundreds, thousands of years of other believers in Jesus. We're part of that family too. And that is amazing. Help those of us who've trusted in Jesus to be encouraged and excited about that. But we also want to pray now that by your spirit, you will inspire us to think of creative ways that especially over the next four weeks, we can put this into practice. Think of ways in which we can physically be kind to other believers in the church. We can be humble, uh, putting their needs before ourselves. We can be patient with one another. Let's just now take a few moments silence just to think about that. And Father, as your Holy Spirit just prompts our minds with suggestions, practical things, I pray that you'll imprint those on our hearts and minds. May we not just go away and forget about them. Uh, We pray now by your Spirit for a conviction, a determination that we won't just going to let this slide and get on with our lives, that we will put these things into practice over the next four weeks especially. And we pray for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. So over to our prayer time now, first of all, Alcus. Thank you, Aaron.